Well, thank you very much, Jack. And it's great to see everyone there in the audience and what a wonderful session so far this morning. It, uh, a lot of great information and a lot of great discussion. And I'm gonna try to, to bank in another direction right now. I, I do kind of feel right now like Daniel in the lion's den, uh, surrounded by a lot of uh, hungry individuals that have, quite frankly, marked their territory and, and proven a lot. But I'm going to take things in a different direction with perspective. Uh, a number of months ago, an acquaintance of mine uh, got in touch with me. I, I hadn't heard from him in a long time. And I asked him, hey, um, how are you doing? How do you spend your days right now? He says, well, I get up in the morning, I go for breakfast, uh, I then go to the gym, work out, I get back in time to have sex, I then have a early lunch, go to the library to read a book, come back in time again for a little more sex, then go for dinner, and, and my only regret in life right now is that I'm up for parole in one year. <laughs> So it, it really is a matter of perspective. And what we need to do is, is keep things in check. And I was really glad to see Lisa bring up Kirkaldi Willis and the three joint complex. And I want to advance that to the degenerative cascade, what we are looking at, the dysfunction, the instability, and the stabilization phases that Kirkaldi Willis described many, many, many years ago. And if you look at it, what we have to decide is where in the degenerative cascade do we apply the various treatments? Right now as spine surgeons, we're in a privileged position. There's all this technology out there. What we need to do is figure out what is the right pathology to treat, when to treat it, and use the correct tools. So if it's in the dysfunction phase, we are probably looking at biologic solutions. We're not there yet, but there's a lot of smart people working on that. If we're in the instability phase with the mid-stage disc degeneration, disc space collapse, internal disc derangements, whatever nomenclature you wanna use for, potentially the motion sparing type technologies with that. But when you've got the end stage, when you've got the facets, you've got the discs, you've got the entire functional complex deteriorating, we're looking at fusions. Maybe we're looking at a facet replacement, some kind of nuclear replacement. We don't quite have that technology yet. And this looking down is great where we're at the early stage biologic regeneration, maybe those mid stages, arthroplasty, nucleoplasty, but the end stage, we're gonna look at fusions. Now, Jack, you brought up those studies, these same five studies that were out there with the five year follow-up. And yes, they were all good studies, but I would maintain that every single one of these studies was a non-inferiority study with, as you termed it, low back pain, sort of the ubiquitous diagnosis, but that's not a diagnosis. I was a pupil of Ian McNabb in Toronto, a giant in spinal surgery who was famous in saying, low back pain is a symptom, not a diagnosis. Work for the diagnosis. What is it that we are truly treating? And to get back to the disc replacement studies, which no one will argue were well done, great information, but they were very restrictive in terms of their clinical indications. And the most profound one was structurally sound posterior elements. We're looking at only disc derangement here. That is the treatment for that pathologic entity. And you know what the contraindications were, fractures, scoli, tumor, infections, all the obvious things that, that are out there right now. So this is one of the very first and, and papers that came out with disc replacements. 
uh, with uh, Camisa, Girardi, Lim, and Wang, where they retrospectively reviewed 100 of their consecutive patients. And essentially, they found that less than 5% of their patients met disc replacement criteria. So we've heard a lot this morning about why disc replacement hasn't taken off. Maybe it's because there just isn't that population out there. It's just not that prevalent right now when we're dealing with all the other things that we are seeing in spinal surgery. And another question we have to ask is with all the technology that's out there today, why have no new lumbar implants been introduced to the market over the last 10 years? Some have argued earlier this morning that it's because of insurance and uptake. Well, again, maybe it's because of the economics of it. And we know that our market is driven by the major medical device manufacturers, and they see this 5% population as not a huge market to tackle. So why invest the R&D dollars in something like that? So there's a trend moving away, but it's, it's not as simple as just saying we don't accept the data or Fusion is paying more for this. There are other factors that we really have not considered up to now. So we know spinal fusions have been around since the early 1900s, initially to treat TB, then spondies, then disc herniations, and now degenerative discs themselves. If you go to the literature from 1935 to 2022, 20,647 citations. I must admit, I thought if I went to PubMed, I'd find a lot more. 20,000 didn't seem like that much to me. But those were the criteria when you just put in lumbar fusion. Now, this is the 2001 Volvo award-winning paper by Fritzel and Hogg that a number of us hung our hats on and justified our existence in life as spinal surgeries with because of the outcome. This was the, the first prospective randomized control trial, lumbar fusion versus non-surgical treatment. 98% follow-up, arguably as good, if not better than the current FDA trials that we've heard about this morning. They showed a statistically significant improvement favoring surgery, with 63% successful clinical outcome with surgery. This is based on surgery that was done over 30 years ago. Very different than what's going on today, than what we've learned, what we've learned about anatomy, about tissue manipulation, about generating the fusion, about spinal alignment. But this was the paper that made us or allowed us to justify our existence. So let's keep going through the literature and see what else we have today comparing the historical to more contemporary. So here's the paper and Luis Pimenta is the senior author on this with his colleagues, minimally invasive versus open surgery for degenerative lumbar pathologies. Again, the grab bag, we're not just looking at internal disc arrangement, this was a systemic review meta analysis, and they concluded that minimally invasive techniques showed a significant reduction in blood loss, hospitalization, complication, and surgical costs. So today we are doing a much better job with fusions than we were doing 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and 30 years ago. So if you take all the literature together, and this is just a synopsis slide when you consider only in chronic back pain who have not responded to a legitimate trial of non-operative modalities or lifestyle modification, fusion rates anywhere from 65 to 99%. Interestingly enough, six to seven out of 10 improved pain and function. Right back to Fritzel and Hogg, the outcome is still relatively the same. Nobody is ever perfect. Two out of 10 report no substantial improvement, not worse. And one out of 10 runs into a complication or is worse after surgery. So despite that, our numbers are the same. 
But what I would suggest is that it's not the fusion which fails, it's the surgeon's appreciation of spinal biomechanics and physiology which fails. And Lisa described that perfectly in her last talk. We still don't understand all the things that we do. We take for granted a lot of what is going on out there. And we think we appreciate the spinal biomechanics and physiology, but we really, really do not. Now, these are slides courtesy of Frank Phillips. I heard him give this talk last week at, at NAS, and I asked him for these to just help bolster my argument about fusions. Complex spine surgery migrating to the ASCs. The outpatient spine fusions are growing from 7% to 22% uh, volume. And we can see what's happening. Again, a reflection of the fact that we're doing better right now. We understand the physiology, the surgical technique. We have better tools today for this. And again, these are two of Frank's papers that he showed the safety and effectiveness of fusions in an ASC environment is very, very well documented. Whether you're doing an X lift, a prone position, a single position lateral, regardless, the safety and effectiveness is very well documented. And this is one of Bill Smith's paper, again, looking at lateral lumbar underbody fusions in an ASC and the safety, and they had no substantial issues, no transfers to inpatient facilities. So we know that we can do a much better job. And when we do that job and consider the biomechanics that we now know, the alignment issues that we now know, we can get better outcomes. So there will always be a role for spinal fusion in the right patient with the right problem done by the right surgeon. But there does not today exist a single study comparing contemporary fusion to disc replacement for defined spinal pathology. Yet this is what we are seeing out there right now. We're seeing a number of these hybrids and the data we have today is all based on non-inferiority studies. So we have to advance. We have to keep going beyond where we are today. And I'll leave you guys with, with the Lieberman axioms of spine surgery. We really have no idea what we are treating. We have no idea what our interventions are really doing. We come to all these meetings and what's presented is 95% good results. We read through the literature and what we learn is there's 90% good results. We observe what happens in our own environments and, and in our, our practices, 67% good results. What the regulatory bodies in C is placebo essentially. They see us as only being half as good as we really think we are. What our patients expect is 100% good results. What the investors expect is a 10 to 15% time return on their investment. And what the major medical device manufacturers expect are 20% margins. So this is what we have to deal with. We all know what happened to Goliath with, with his onslaught, but I'm gonna stand my ground <laughs> with spinal fusion for the vast majority of what we do deal with today. Thank you guys. Isidore, so are you the, are you David or are you Goliath in this analogy? Oh, I'm David. I'm staying. I got Goliath, my the man. room there. Look, look at the charge, the onslaught. You guys stuck me in this little bucket here. <laughs> Your head is so big right now. The closer you get to the camera, the more you resemble Goliath, I have to say. <laughs> We're, let me ask you the following thing. This is a very nice lecture, uh, uh, but I, I had to watch out that I did not throw up when I heard the Fritzell study one more time. So I've, I've been tortured in our states questioning lumbar fusions even. And I've regurgitated that and the Oxford study and the Norwegian study more than I ever care. And there are many things to talk about that. One of the key things is patient preference for me. So I don't know how it is in Texas. I encounter a lot of patients now who even if they clearly, clearly, clearly need a fusion, don't want a fusion. I think the word has gotten out that fusions are something bad. Is that something that you've seen as a reality and where does patient preference actually factor in this decision-making process if there's true equipoise of surgical treatment? 
So it's, it's absolutely an issue. Every day we see people coming saying, I don't want a fusion. The perception of fusion is that it is a bad operation. And that's our own fault because we have not shown the studies and the numbers. Now, if you go back to those FDA trials, those fusion patients that were done with second generation fusion techniques, not first generation Fritzel techniques, second generation techniques through the 90s and, and early 2000s, actually did pretty darn good. There's very, very good fusion results in that group. And again, the disc arthroplasties were, uh, or the study was designed as disc arthroplasty being non-inferior to the fusion. So you can't say one or another from a statistical perspective. Now, what we need to do as the stewards, as the leaders of the healthcare team is teach, educate our patients in a shared decision-making fashion, symptom-specific surgery. This is what your problem is. This is the most ideal treatment, and it may not be surgery. It may be a decompression, or it may be a fusion, or yeah, it may be a disc replacement. But symptom-specific, pathology-specific is what we should be advocating for. Agree. Um, one more question, then we'll switch to the lab. And we have a premiere. I hope you'll, from home, watch what's going to happen here in the lab because we'll interact very closely. Malalignment. So when you look at the big picture, I know you're surrounded by disc arthroplasty people in Dallas and uh, in Plano. Uh, when you have people with mild coronal deformities, I see a lot of those, they have a tilt of about 10 degrees uh, in a coronal plane. In your big picture, if you can uh, look at that, is that a clearly better case for a fusion or can you correct that with a disc arthroplasty? When you look at your rounds, when you look at your conferences, how do those people do with disc arthroplasties versus fusions? So I can't answer how they do with disc arthroplasty versus fusion because I don't think any one of us have documented those results well enough. Uh, very strategic, Jens, that you said 10 degrees because the study cutoff was 11 degrees. So there, there is no answer. I would suggest that we don't have a disc replacement today that can address coronal and sagittal malalignment adequately. Uh, you brought up earlier on patient-specific level specific implants. And that's where we have to go. There's no doubt about that in my mind. That is what we need. And that goes well beyond just disc replacement. We need patient specific, level specific, surgical solutions in those patients that have been unresponsive to the typical non-operative treatment modalities. And I'll put another plug out. We've got to keep this in our realm. We cannot allow the non-surgical colleagues of ours to start dipping into this and promoting their treatments as surgical treatments for alignment type issues. I want to make one editorial comment. So it's frequently pointed out in an almost, I now know you didn't do that, in an almost accusatory fashion that these famous trials of uh, disc replacements versus uh, fusions were non-inferiority trials. I, I sat on some of those FDA panels at the time. These were mandated by the FDA. This was not uh, a industry choice. Uh, so I, I want to just be fair. Uh, this was uh, basically um, a, a mandated form of uh, um, kind of trial design. And I know I've been in front of many committees now where this is held up as, hey, you didn't do a superiority trial. Why didn't you do a superiority trial? I think the time is almost ripe for that, but maybe we're past that. Thank you, Izzy, and I hope you'll stay on because all of you at home uh, are in for a treat. For first ever in the world, we have a triple simultaneous surgical lab going on. And we have three stars for that, and they're all here, obviously. Dr. Ziegler, Dr. Blumenthal, and Dr. Kachapian.